It's been a couple days since I had a chance to get back down here. I really need to start making notes of where I left off, but I believe we left off with, uh, I had just finished setting the post flow timer for the, uh, for the shielding gas flow. So next I'm going to look at my settings for my, uh, for my welder. At this point, it would be probably good to mention those of you who don't follow my channel regularly wouldn't know what I had for a welder. So this is an Airco model 3A slash DDR 245 HPA slash B dash D. You can pretty much ignore all of this and for all intents purposes, intense purposes, anyways, all... <laughs> If you're looking for this welder online because uh, you're looking for information on repairs or how to use it or parts or anything like that, just use model Airco model 3A slash DDR. And actually, even if you just put Airco 3A in, pretty much you'll get a bunch of information on these. Um, these welders were actually pretty common back in the day, but they were more commonly sold under the original manufacturer's badge which was Miller. So the Miller, I think it's the Miller 330 ABP. Uh, going by memory here. But anyways, there's a Miller welder, looks exactly like this, which led people to speculate that Miller had them made by Airco or vice versa. But my understanding is that it was, no, Miller made it and it was badged and sold under Airco, but it was also sold under Miller. The Millers look exactly like this, except instead of this beautiful orange and red circus color, they have the traditional Miller blue color. Matter of fact, some guys who uh, get these, they even take the time to paint these blue. Anyways, so this is a transformer style welder. It uses a spark gap circuit to generate the high frequency, uh, which, uh, you know, is good and bad and I'm not going to get into all that but basically these welders are ancient technology archaic they've been replaced by the inverter welders the problem with inverter welders inverter welders are more susceptible to breakdown especially in the case of a power surge I have known people who have had very expensive nice welders that were left connected to the power lines when they weren't being used and during a power surge event such as a thunderstorm had their welders damaged to the point where the uh, welder was so badly damaged that it um, it was basically one of those situations where you had to buy a board or something inside that was so expensive that at that point it wasn't even worth doing so lots of times you'll see broken ones for sale and you got to be wary of that. Uh, a lot of the, I'm going to get off the subject here real quick, but I'm just going to try and mention real quick. A lot of the inverter welders use solid state devices called IGBT and those are, that stands for insulated gate bipolar transistors. Okay, which are a special type of transistor and the ones that are in there are very high power and they're consequently very expensive and when those go bad, uh, it can also be very expensive to repair. But I'm not a welder repair guy, so I probably shouldn't even be talking out of my you-know-what on this subject. Getting back to this archaic old transformer welder. So, for weekend warrior and hobbyists and noobs getting into TIG welding, these can be a great buy. A lot of these go to the scrapyard. And so a lot of times when these pop up, they'll pop up for sale. Now, oftentimes they're, they've been in a shop and somebody's been using them for years and years and years and they remember what they paid for the thing new or they know that it's a damn good welder and it's served them well all these years. So you'll tend to see them priced kind of high, but they won't sell at that price. So oftentimes you can just, uh, like in the case of how I got this welder, when I originally saw this welder come up for sale, it was a lot more money. And then the price just kept dropping and dropping and dropping and it became clear to me that the guy who had it just wanted to get rid of the welder and had no idea 
what the current market value of it was and was just going to wait and see at what point did he drop the price low enough that he would get a new fish to come and grab that hook and I did. So I really got a good deal on this because it came with it came with a nice uh, water-cooled tick torch. Well, the tick torch needed to be repaired, but that's another story. Came with a really good water cooler, a Dynaflux water cooler, which is quite an expensive water cooler. It came with the uh, the foot pedal. It came with um, uh, st the stick electro cables, extra long ones, heavy duty ones, and some other cabling. It came with all the hoses, and it came with that huge tank of argon that I just showed a few minutes ago. And although that's a leased tank, it was leased so long ago that um, that company is not even going to care anymore. And I know my local air gas supplier already said yeah, they'll swap it out for me. So, and it's huge. It's a, I don't know what that is. That's like a 220 cubic foot for a hobbyist like me. And based on the pressure in the tank, I'd say it's still got quite a bit left. I think it's going to last me a while. Did I get far enough off the subject yet? I said I was going to talk about the settings. Okay, settings. Let's talk polarity first. Hookup, on, on my welder down here where the electrodes hook up, basically it says work on one connection. That's where your ground clamp goes. And then the other connection says electrode. So that's where the stick electrode would go for straight polarity or your TIG. Um, your TIG torch is gonna go to that, okay? So polarity. You want DC electrode negative. Well, AC is for aluminum. DC electrode negative, also known, and I guess this is in the old days, as straight polarity. DC electrode positive would be reverse polarity. You never want to attempt to TIG weld with reverse polarity or DC electrode positive. If you do, your what happens is too much heat goes into the tungsten and the tungsten will start to quickly melt away on you. So not good. So DC electrode negative, AKA straight polarity. Got it? Got it. So next up, I'm going to set my amperage. Now, um, amperage on a new inverter machine is so easy to set. On this machine, it's a little bit different. So I have Basically, I have an amperage range selector, okay, which is this big lever here, which, by the way, you never, ever want to switch any of these levers while it's under load. Now, what that means is, it's just kind of funny to me that they even have to say that. What that means is while you're welding, that's when the current's flowing. So who is going to reach over a little literally be laying down a bead and reach over and grab this handle and switch it i don't know but anyways um to be on the safe side i actually usually make sure that i have the thing off or, or do i i don't know i usually set it when it's off and then i go so we've got these little tr boxes down here the uh it's kind of color coded you'll notice that it's orange for ac it's black for the dcs so the same thing with this range here. Black is for DC. So this box right here is 20 to 250 amps and then 20 to 230 amps for AC when it's in this position here. This position maxes, uh, looks like 80 amps. I have a 330 seconds electrode, which is supposedly capable to run up to 185 amps. And actually on one of my weld.com charts I just printed out, it claims it can go all the way up to 250. So I'm probably going to want to try, I'm going to start out probably at around 150 amps. So I'm going to switch this selector to the middle position. All right. Oh, actually that's 60. So that, this is the range I had previously been trying to weld on when I was just, um, when I was working on this welder, getting the high frequency to work and, and setting it up for the first time. And, uh, so that's interesting. That's only 60 amps. So anyway, all right. So now here's where it gets tricky. Note the big variable amperage control up here. We also have a remote amperage control, which is my foot pedal plugged in here. When this switch is in standard, this is ignored. The remote amperage control is ignored and everything happens here. However, when it's in standard, 
it doesn't want to TIG weld. I think there's some sort of, there's probably another part of this switch that's used to disable that feature, which makes sense. Yeah, so this is the range switch, and then you've got this big knob up here, and I was saying that when this switch is in standard, you can't TIG weld. So we have this in remote. So there's an interesting interrelationship between this and this and this. So unlike some machines where you just dial up the amperage and go to town, um, this machine has this amperage adjustment here, okay? But you'll notice it's zero to 100. But because we have a range switch, this is not zero to 100 amps. This is zero to 100%. Zero to 100% of what the range switch is set to. So you gotta do a little math on the fly. Huh? So basically, and the other thing that's confusing is the minimum range, like on, even on this range here, minimum is five amps. So it appears like they're literally saying, yeah, you really can't get down to zero. So I don't even know why they have a zero here. In other words, and I actually have tried in this range, turning this all the way down and you can still draw an arc. I did that just because I wanted to see whether or not I could see the high frequency without drawing an arc. No, nope, it drew an arc every time the high frequency fired, so, and I got close enough. So, can't do that. Getting back to this though. So, the weird thing is, you got 20 to 250. So, what I've had to make the assumption of is that when I crank this to 100, okay, that that would be 250 amps in this range. And that when I crank this to 50, that would be half of 250 or 125 amps. All right, you with me so far? But again, then that would mean that this should be zero amps, but in fact, what it actually says on the thing here is that that's 20 amps, which is, so that's what's kind of a pain. So not quite sure yet on how that would work. Or is 50 halfway between 20 and 250, which is, well, let's see, 250 minus 20 is 230, half of 230 is 115. So is this 115 amps? We're only talking 10 amps difference here. So to make the math easier in my head, I'm just gonna go on the assumption that this is half of 250. So that's 125 amps. And then if I wanted to, if I divide 125 amps by five, one, two, three, four, five, if I divide 125 amps by five, I can actually figure out roughly how many more amps I'm going to get per 10, 10 an extra 10 on here. So if I'm at 125 there and I add, a hundred uh, and go to 10 more that should be almost 150 amps okay so let's try that we got a 330 seconds electrode we're actually welding metal that is thick enough that we could use an eighth inch electrode but for my experimental first noob try here I'm going to uh, go with that Last setting that I want to talk about, well, okay, some of you may have noticed the start adjustment. I, I know that when TIG welding, uh, no, I'm sorry, when, when stick welding, what this start adjustment does is this allows you to actually increase or decrease the start amperage when you first strike an arc. So what that allows you to do is that allows you to either have a soft start um, or that allows you to have a hot start. So if you're, I think, I think they actually call this a dig function on some welders when as far as the hot start goes. And I think my, my noob understanding of it is that basically if you have like a rod that is harder to start, that you can turn this up and it will give you uh, better starts on those rods. But as soon as the arc's initiated, it, the machine will throttle back that amperage to 
your what you've got this set for. If that makes sense. And then the soft start, not quite sure. You know, again, an experienced welder would know why you would want a soft start. Why would you why you would want lower amperage at the very start? Maybe you're you're welding something and you don't want a a, a a big gouged out puddle at the beginning or something when you're first getting it. I don't know. I don't know. That doesn't make sense to me. I can't wrap my head around that one. I'm just not weld smart enough. Okay. So last thing is high frequency. I have high frequency over here. I have three positions. I have start, off, continuous. Off is if you're going to scratch start with this machine. Remember, there is no lift start on this. Continuous means that your high frequency is on. As soon as you hit the, the contactor closes, the high frequency turns on. It initiates an arc, and the high frequency stays on during the whole weld pro the whole weld process. That is for extra cleaning action on AC aluminum welding. We want start. What happens with start is as soon as the contactor closes, high frequency is initiated. Once an arc is started, the high frequency will automatically shut off. And if the arc extinguishes for some reason, uh, the high frequency will come right back on. So that's what we want. All right, so now it's time to talk about welding safety. Now let's talk about some of the essential safety equipment that you want to use when you're uh, TIG welding. Well, just kidding. My welder is pretty loud. <laughs> <laughs> all of the safety equipment I'm going to discuss is important, but without a doubt I think we can all agree the most important would be your welding helmet. The welding helmet's primary job is to protect your eyes from the high intensity UV radiation and light coming off of the weld. The arc, more specifically. Now the way that it does that is that it has a lens that is shaded and it's sort of like uh, sunglasses on steroids and the amount of shading that the lens has is graded on a scale and they give it a, a number. So for instance, you have all different shades, shades 10, 11, 12, are all different varieties of shades. So you might have a much lighter shade than a 10 uh, might be used for, believe it or not, when you're grinding. Now, most of you are probably like me, weekend warriors and you don't grab uh, a grinding uh, you don't grab a, uh, a helmet to protect your eyes or anything to protect your eyes while you're grinding but the reality is that if you're on a job where you're grinding a lot all day long uh, over time that can take a toll I have to believe that that's the case anyways because otherwise why would they specifically have grinding settings on a lot of auto darkening helmets and I'll, I'll talk about those in a moment so getting back to the uh, helmet so we have different shades for your, for your uh, you're going to typically use a higher number for arc welding, uh, stick welding, because the arc is much more intense. When you get to TIG welding, because of the type of arc that it is, and it's a small plume that's more concentrated, the intensity isn't as high. So what happens is you need to use a lower shade, otherwise you're going to have trouble visualizing the weld pool. The, the pool of molten metal which we need to keep an eye on so we can see what the heck we're doing. Not to mention where your filler rod is entering the pool and the plume. So that being said, uh, you can either, if you have an old-fashioned manual helmet like this, where you actually just uh, have it propped up on your head and you flip it, you, you visualize where you're going to be, you get your, um, your tungsten close and you flip your helmet head down and uh, you nod your head and this thing will flip down and then you you strike the arc and once the arc light comes up you'll be able to see what you're doing. So if you have an old one like this you actually have to change this lens out to a lighter lens. And I often wondered what would be a good, you know, a good guide for that kind of information. Well, once again the people over at weld.com came out with a chart that I printed out here and uh, what's interesting is they actually this is a guide for welding helmet shade numbers so they actually kind of uh, and this is going to be unique to each individual and I think they realize that because there's actually quite a range here 
but for instance, up here, it's shielded metal arc welding. Oh, let me let me just stop and say, I am in no way I am in no way affiliated with this website, and they do not pay me one dime. I'm just passing this information on because this is the only place where I was able to find this in a nice chart form. And for a noob like me starting out, it's nice to know. So, shielded metal arc welding, okay, stick welding. Minimum shades. Well. Basically, it depends on the electrode size, which makes sense. So, you know, if you're using, uh, you know, larger electrodes, you're going to have a more intense, larger arc giving off more light. You're going to go up to like a shade 11. But if you're using um, a very small electrode, you might go all the way down to a shade 7, it says here. And that's arc current of less than 60 amps. That's not going to be typical, I'm pretty sure. So then there's uh, gas metal arc welding and flux cord welding. And then there is... All right, so gas metal welding and flux core welding, in case you don't know, that's MIG. And gas tungsten arc welding. Well, that's TIG. And if we look at TIG welding... If we're at less than 50 amps, they say shade 8. 50 to 150 amps, shade 8. And 150 to 500, shade 10. So what I'm going to do is I'm probably going to start with a shade 10. And that may very well be too dark. Uh, and if it is, I'll back it down. And we'll, uh, we'll see, you know, make sure I can visualize the puddle and still protect my eyes. So the first welding I ever taught myself was uh, stick welding. It's probably the most common uh, welding used by hobbyists, weekend warriors, farmers, mechanics uh, when they're first starting out because it's one of the cheapest. Um, it's one of the cheapest ways to get into welding. I mean, you literally just need an arc welder, some basic safety equipment, and uh, um, you know some electrodes. So. The thing is, when you're learning how to arc weld for the first time, you can make proper rod selection because there are some rods that are a lot easy to work with. And I'm getting off the TIG subject here, so I just want to talk about, you know, when you're first starting out and everything, you need to learn how to strike an arc. And let's pretend that this is a, uh, this piece of chalk is the end of a stick electrode. And you, you're trying to strike the arc without the rod sticking. You can, in, you know, I've gone through nightmares of, of just having trouble with this. And... When I was first starting out, I would have to say that one of the biggest improvements I made when I was starting out, and if I gave, as a noob, if I was going to give another noob one piece of advice, if they're just starting out and they want to learn how to weld, invest in an auto-darkening helmet. Because with a flip-down helmet, you know, I'll tell you, experienced welders have no problem at all. But when you're starting out and you're trying to work on striking an arc and making sure that where you initiate the arc that you, you cover up your arc strikes and, and, and you're going to be losing the arc a lot because you're not used to, you're not used to uh, as that electrode dis you know, disappears because it's being consumed as a filler metal, keeping that arc dist that, uh, that distance correct. You're going to have trouble doing that, visualizing the weld pool and all of that stuff. So... What I recommend is I recommend an auto darkening welding helmet, which when they first came on the market were quite expensive, but now there are ample sources for cheap auto darkening helmets, and that's a whole other subject as far as like which auto darkening helmets that are cheap or good. I happen to have invested in a higher quality um, auto darkening helmet. This is the 3M 9100 series speed glass so speed glass is a series of welding helmets by 3m they have a ton of different ones uh, this is the 9100 series this one has if you notice it, it instead of having just that small rectangle it has quite a large um, frame here uh, field of view here this also has side windows here which you can cover them up if you don't like them. Some people, some guys like them, some guys don't. So inside the helmet, we have a control panel here, and we can control a couple of different parameters. We can control the delay, 
uh, but most importantly we can set the shade so there's actually a line they give you kind of a, a line of declination there to let you know that anything below that line this company has deemed pretty much not safe so shade 13 is the darkest I've never had it on that uh, shade 9 is the lowest you can go before you get below that line shade 8 and shade uh, shade 5 are below that so it goes down to it goes down 13 12 11 10 9 8 then it jumps all the way down to 5 so 5 would be like you're grinding not sure about 8 like so like I said I'm gonna start at 10 probably go to 9 I'm hoping 9 is gonna be good enough so next up I want to talk about protective clothing you know when I'm stick welding I have a welding shirt that has long sleeves that the cuffs snap closed tight around my wrist not tight but you know tight enough and then my welding gloves come up over that so I've got good protection uh, I wear a leather apron um, some guys have pants um, I find the leather apron works out well for me I also kind of like that the apron has a little pocket I can keep a couple of little things in it um, while I'm welding if I need them uh, so that's for stick welding and that's because stick welding in addition to the high intensity arc light which can give you the worst sunburn in your life and you won't know it until after you finish welding but uh, you never want to have that happen I've never experienced it but I've spoken to guys who've had it done you know guys who were like in a hurry they had one little job and they figured hey well I'm just gonna do this real quick I don't want to don all the equipment protect myself and then uh, they get uh, arc flash so I protect my skin really well now with TIG welding because again it's not as intense uh, the arc light is not as intense as stick welding that leads a lot of guys to take a lot less precaution when it comes to protecting themselves I have seen uh, guys TIG welding in short sleeve shirts well, I, you know, everybody's got their own opinion on what they think is safe for them. And that's going to come up again in a moment, believe me. But for right now, I'm telling you, my choice is I'm going to protect all of my exposed skin. Uh, pretty much my helmet protects my neck, my chin, you know, my face. And a uh, long sleeve shirt. I'm not going to probably wear my welding shirt only because I'm not really worried about sparks uh, flying onto my arms and burning holes in my clothing. And then, not that that can't happen with TIG, but. Uh, and also, my wrists are going to be covered by my TIG gloves. Now, you can use any type of welding glove for TIG welding. The problem is the manual dexterity that's required for TIG welding and feeding the, the filler rod basically mandates that you want to get some gloves that are going to give you that manual dexterity so they have TIG gloves which basically aren't as heavy duty as stick welding gloves or the gloves you would use for oxyacetylene for instance so here's some of my these are my welding gloves um, these are the ones I probably use most often as you can tell from the dirt and grime on them these uh, these are something else. These have heat shields on them. I've actually, I got these with, again, that cabinet that has some welding equipment in them. I've, uh, I've never used these, but they, they look cool. <laughs> They're obviously for some sort of process where there's a lot of radiant heat happening here. And then it has a pair of more standard welding gloves these red ram ones um, these are stiff these are pretty supple but compared to TIG gloves they're really bulky they're very stiff you're not gonna have the dexterity in your fingertips that really is needed especially if you're a noob like me so you can go online to your favorite welding supply or you can go into your weight or you know for your favorite major uh, name welding supply and go through all the TIG gloves that are there and find yourself something that you really like yeah but it can get kind of pricey so I headed over to the old Harbor Freight 
and the reason why I bought them there was again I'm just a noob so starting out I got these Vulcan Defender Master Welder Series gloves. The reason why I got these was because I went online and looked at the ratings and these are actually rated really high. I'll tell you another dirty little secret. These, were, these ran me like 10 bucks at Harbor Freight and as a matter of fact I didn't even have my coupon because I'm on the email list and usually I, I've got a coupon. I could have probably got these for like 8 bucks. Uh, I've seen these selling online for as much as like $20 a pair. So I don't know why anybody would well, I guess convenience, not having to go to a Harbor Freight. Maybe you live someplace where there's no Harbor Freight nearby. Anywho, Vulcan Defenders are what I ended up going with. And you can see, really all they are is they're almost like a calf skin glove. They're much uh, much more flexible. You can see I can, I can get more, not so much closed down as much, but there's definitely more dexterity here in the fingertips which is what we're going for. So they take almost like a regular calfskin glove and then they just put on this extra leather cuff to give you that protection here on your lower part of your arm, cover your wrist. So that's what I'm gonna be doing. I remember where I was talking about, I'm not gonna chastise people, uh, they don't wanna be safe or if they don't think they need to be protecting themselves against certain things in a certain way. And then it was gonna come up again. Well, here's where it comes up again. We're talking about protecting your lungs. When you weld any weld process, I don't care, MIG, tick, stick, whatever, you are going to generate smoke, whether or vapors and or vapors, whether you can see them in the form of normal smoke or they are invisible, I don't know, but you're going to generate something and you're going to breathe that stuff in if you don't protect yourself. Now, there are several ways you could protect yourself. Probably the easiest way is if you can, you can weld outside. If you weld outside or in a quote-unquote well-ventilated area, maybe that'll work. Here's the problem. If you're stick welding and you're outside and it's a windy day, no problem at all. That stick weld's not going to care. The flux coming off of that, uh, that electrode is going to do its job and protect that weld. Well, TIG welding, we're dealing with shielding gas. And if you are in a windy area while you're trying to use shielding gas, the shielding gas will not be covering the weld pool. And you're going to end up with oxidation and poor quality welds. So, uh, and I'll tell you what, and even if you were outside TIG welding and it wasn't windy, I still think, in my personal opinion, I, th I still think you want to have something protecting your lungs. And I'll tell you why. I have found that it seems like the fumes from welding have a tendency to want to rise up and go right up underneath the chin of my helmet. Now, they do make a, uh, I don't know, for lack of a better term, a bib that can go around your neck. And I think there's even a way for it to clip into this uh, this helmet to kind of Make sure that that stuff as it's rising up or anything that could possibly splatter under your neck is not able to do so. So the second possibility of uh, getting rid of your fumes is to have what's called a fume extractor. And you've probably seen uh, several of the pros online using a fume extractor. Uh, I was in my local air gas a couple of weeks ago and they always have some really pretty beautiful blue Miller equipment there and I always kind of look go oh, if only well anyways getting back to the fume extractors they had a fume extractor there and it was a Miller and the thing basically looks like uh, uh, it looks like it should be one of the robots that guest appears on Mystery Science Theater 2000 it, it, it's got this big hose on it um, you know, probably about the, the diameter of like maybe six or eight inches. And it's got a, uh, like almost like a cone shape on the end. And you put that in proximity to where you're welding and you turn this thing on. And what it does is it sucks in the fumes from your welding process and runs it through a special filter so that the air coming back out into your shop area is, uh, safe. So that's how those things work. The, 
problem with those things are they're very expensive. So a new weekend warrior type is not most likely going to get one of those unless he gets a real deal on one. And even if he gets a really good deal on one at an auction or something like that, chances are the filter in it's going to need to be replaced. And the filters aren't, uh, they're not, some of those filters can be kind of cost prohibitive, I should say. And so then you might not change the filter and then you're really not, you know, the thing's really not doing you much good. That's uh, to, to a point, I would say. Uh, getting off the subject again, Steve. All right, so what is a noob to do? What is a poor weekend warrior type welder supposed to do to protect himself? Well, we have respirators. So I've got a few of my respirators here just to show you what won't work. And, you know, this is the older style. Uh, I've had this one forever. This is, uh, this, you can see it has a lot of paint on it because this is the respirator that built this house. <laughs> I used this extensively during uh, the painting of all the ceilings and walls uh, in the house. So it's got these big cumbersome cans on it. And the problem with that is you put that on your face and you're going to have problems getting your helmet over your face. This is a, a more modern 3M version of that, okay? And we've got pre-filters, which are here, and then behind it we have a cartridge, which is probably an organic vapor or particulate, I forget what it is. But anyways, that this, uh, this, this right here, I believe, is a 7,000 series. Yeah, this is a 7,000 series um, mask, and with these more conventional filters, a little more low profile than what we were just looking at, but still a little bit bulky. This I just kind of showed you as a joke. Can't get that in there, right? So the folks over at 3M, I mean, other manufacturers have done it also, but the folks over at 3M came up with a uh, solution for people who want to be able to wear a respirator such as this underneath their welding helmet while welding. Um, and they came up with what uh, is called the 6000 and 7000 series of welding masks. So this is actually a 7000 series mask, but the types of filters that are on it make it too cumbersome for under the mask. So I ended up having a brand new unused mask, and this is a 7512. So this is definitely a 7000 series mask. So I thought to myself, well, why can't I use this? And then I, I was like, well, wait a minute. This has the same types of cumbersome filters on it. So I was like, oh, so this is not, even though this is a uh, 7000 series mask, this is not the right type for welding. But then when I went online and I went to 3M's website, which is a little cumbersome to navigate, to say the least, and started looking around, I couldn't quite figure out exactly how the heck these numbers worked on these things. But it turns out, if you look at, there's a number right here. This is a 7502, and this one is also the same thing, 7502. The 7000 series masks, this part right here, actually contains the part number 7501, 02, or 03. And those are the only difference between those three masks are size, small, medium, and large for the size of your face. So what makes this a 7512 painter's mask, so to speak, is just the fact that they bundle it with these pre-filters and these 6001 organic vapor cartridges. So your organic vapor cartridges are going to be great for fumes from painting, uh, particles from sanding, things like that. And there's a guide online where you can actually go and see what each one of these does. But again, website can be a little cumbersome to navigate, a little bit diff difficult to get around sometimes. So what I found is, I found you, there's a cheat. What you do is, you go to one of the distributors that are selling 3M, or even Amazon, for instance. If I go to, uh, for instance, Airgas's website, and I look at what they have, and then I see what they, I you know, filter by manufacturer 3M, and then I'm looking for respirators, and I go down the list and everything, lo and behold, I find the quote-unquote welding respirators, okay, or the ones that are optimized for welding. All they are, are the 750102 and 03s packaged with these low profile filters. They're these pink puppies right here. The P100 particulate filter. 
these particular ones are 2097s. So my big question was, well, wait a minute. How do I know that all these P100s are the same? So that's when I go back to the website and I look and I look at what they're used for. And it turns out that from what I was able to find online, the P100s are actually used for welding. So I have my P100 filters, but do they fit this? Well, I know somebody over at 3M. I know somebody very smart over at 3M. And they told me that, oh, you know what? All 3M particulate and cartridge filters or whatever you want to call them, all 3M filters interchange with all 3M masks of this type. In other words, this is a proprietary thing with them. So the only thing you can't do is you can't go to another manufacturer uh, and put their filter on 3M's face mask. But, sure enough, you look at the back of this, you can see it's kind of fit. Look how thin these are. So it's like a bayonet style locking tab type of action pressure cooker deal and all you gotta do is put them on, line up the tabs, put them on and give them about a quarter turn rotation. And you can actually feel, there'll be almost like a little click you can feel where they lock on. And now, I've just turned my 7512 professional paint respirator into a respirator I can wear under my welding helmet. Yay! So here's the documentation that came with the filters, not the mask, okay? And if we look right here, it says particulate filter, okay? P100 and these two other, the 2097s. Here's mine right here. Metal fumes predicted for welding. Okay, so, so there's actually, wow, 2091, 2291, 2096, 2296, 2097, 2297 are, are all used for, um, they're, all, they're all okay for fumes produced from the heating of metals. So there we go. All right, so before we uh, leave the subject of safety equipment let me just show you the uh what i think is probably like considered the cadillac of professional welding gear that uh gives you the best of both worlds so to speak this is the 3m speed glass version of this system it's called the ad flow and what you what you've got is you've got the 3m speed glass auto darkening helmet uh this is an older model so i forgot what series this is Basically, it's the same helmet that I just showed you that I use. It's just got a smaller window here. Um, but what it's got is built into the helmet, it's got this deal here, which is almost like ductwork, that takes fresh air and blows it up over the top of the helmet where it can exit out and blow across your face. And basically, that creates a pressure zone of clean air across your face that's going to keep any smoke from being able to be inhaled gives you fresh, cool, well, relatively cool, air. So this would be important to somebody who's welding for long periods of time with the helmet down uh, and needs to uh, have really good ventilation going all the time. And so this hose hooks up to this device right here, which has this very comfortable wide belt to hold it around your waist. It's actually upside down. It sits like this because this has a little bit of weight to it, but then what's missing here is the large, the earlier ones have a NICAD and I believe the new ones are lithium ion battery pack that sits on here to run this thing. Because this thing has the filtration built into it and it's got a whole fan unit in there that's gonna pull shop air or surrounding air through here, filter it, make sure it's nice and clean, and then send it out through this hose into the helmet so the helmet can do its job. Great system uh, from what I've heard. Never been able to use it. I scored this on a crazy good deal at a flea market. And these systems new are like somewhere north of $1,500 or something like that. This is an older series, but it's still very serviceable except for one problem. The guy I bought it from does cleanouts, and he grabbed this from wherever he grabbed it and either didn't realize or didn't find that any of the batteries or the charger. 
the battery for this system is a proprietary battery that's this specific shape, okay, to fit this thing. And the damn batteries are new from 3M. They're like crazy money. I forgot how many hundreds of dollars they are for a battery. And then new from 3M, the charger is also crazy money. As I think, I think it's over $100. Best price on the charger that I was able to find was somewhere around like 80 or 90 bucks on like eBay. Um, by the way, the charger, it looks like an AC wall adapter, probably a little switch mode power supply, cheapo charger that is made in China for a cost of, uh, you know, under 20 bucks for the whole thing. So, um, not happy with the, not happy with that. Uh, and then the battery, again, the battery, cause it's proprietary, crazy money. I've seen batteries online. The cheapest batteries for this ad flow thing that I could find was still around like a hundred to 150 bucks a piece. And they're coming from overseas sources. So I'm a little wary of that. Matter of fact, I actually bought one of those batteries. I bought one of those batteries from a seller in England. Uh, he had the best price on them. Um, they were supposedly brand new 3M batteries. And I bought and I paid. And, you know, to eBay's credit, they covered me because I waited and I waited and I waited and it never came in. So I reported it to eBay and eBay refunded my complete purchase price. But lesson learned. And there's more than one seller that, they seem to all be coming out of England, but there was more than one seller that seemed to have these. But after I got burned on the first one, I was like, oh, God, you know, I just don't know what to do. I even posted if anybody had any extra old bad ad flow batteries because um, I went on the welding web forum and I posted that I was searching for these and nobody's got them. And what I was hoping was somebody had a bad one that they would, you know, sell me dirt cheap. And then what I would do is I would take the bad one, cut it open, replace the cells inside the battery, and then epoxy the damn thing all closed up again and basically have a real hacked job here. So I haven't decided yet what I'm going to do with this thing. Uh, I really should just sell it. But I keep thinking, hey, maybe I, uh, there's a way I could hack this thing so that I could get it to run off of, you know, some other type of battery pack, like a, like a lithium-ion drill battery pack or something like that. But that's a whole other story. I just thought you guys might want to see that there are some pretty cool choices out there. If you have the deep enough pockets. So the last thing I want to talk about is metal preparation. Metal prep. So metal preparation just means uh, getting the metal ready for the welding process. The thing with TIG welding is TIG welding wants clean metal. I can't stress how many times I've run across that. You've got some dirty old rusty painted thing, you might be able to blow through it with some stick welding, but with TIG welding, fresh clean metal is what you really want as much as possible because when that arc is heating up that process and it's gonna boil up any contaminants that are on the surface there, you're gonna have problems. That's gonna get into your weld pool and contaminate the weld and cause problems. That's why castings can be difficult to repair. Um, because castings tend to be porous in nature, so you have all those little tiny, tiny microscopic holes in the casting where dirt and oils can go to die, and uh, it just seems like it's, it can be difficult, to say the least, to get a casting clean. You might look, look like it really is really clean at the surface, and as soon as you start developing that weld pool, you'll start cooking out all of that stuff that's stuck in there. So that's, that's a whole other subject and that's not really new worthy. The um, piece of scrap junk du jour is a ATV CV joint. I already wire wheeled this to get any possible rustage off the surface of this thing. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna wipe it down with acetone. Now if you don't have acetone, I suggest a lot of deep knee bends. No, just kidding, acetone, not acetone, acetone. Acetone, the special purpose, thinner, cleaner, and remover evaporates quickly. So what's nice about acetone, and one of the reasons why it's probably used 
in the industry is it's good at cleaning off any of that stuff that you don't want on the surface that you might not see like oils and things like that and more importantly it evaporates quickly so that it leaves no residue so that you're not going to have some kind of chemical compound that you're going to heat up and cook okay okay oh yeah if you get it outside enough times you get this at least the cap was on all right, well, my breakfast is ready. It's perfect timing. That way I can have breakfast and when I come down here, we'll strike some arcs. So I just wanna talk real quick about what you're gonna see or maybe not see. I'm gonna set up my second camera. This is my main go-to camera, it's a GoPro. Um, I have a Samsung Enviro, Enviro or whatever they call it, their uh, small camcorder. I'm gonna try and set that up to take some arc shots. Uh, I've never tried taking arc shots before, so I don't know how that's going to work out. My plan is I have several of these old lenses. Uh, this one is a shade 8. I have, I think I've got some 8s, a 10, 11, and a 12. I'm going to start with a shade 8. And then uh, if that actually works, I'll include the video. And if it doesn't, I'm going to have to figure out a way to hold this in front of the camera lens. And hopefully the camera will be able to uh, adjust auto exposure and all of that stuff. All right, time for breakfast, and I will be back. All right, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get any arc shots, quite frankly. I had to give up on using the uh, Samsung Viro camera camcorder because I couldn't find the charging cable for that. I haven't used it in such a long time, so... I've gone back to my old trusty Nikon SLR and using it in video mode. Um, this camera is what I was using before the GoPro. And I've got this set up and I've got it zoomed in here. Uh, if this is going to be able to work where I'm going to put these the shade on here with elastic bands. You know, kind of shaky, but it's best I can do. My problem is every time this camera shuts off and you turn it back on it runs a quick test of the motor and the uh, zoom and if there's anything obstructing the lens from being able to pop out like it is right now uh, it throws a lens error message and basically the camera doesn't work so i'm going to have to figure out a way i think what i'm going to do is i'm going to get this thing all set up start it recording and then put the lens on and then get everything else ready so I'm just going to have a ton of video I'll just end up editing out before you guys end up having to see it. Hopefully in the end we'll end up getting some arc shots. So it's important to be comfortable. Um, so it's not a bad idea before you actually even power on the machine to just get into the position you're going to be in and see whether or not it's going to work for you. So I've got basically I'm able to brace myself on the table here. So I think this is going to work out okay. We'll see. So I just wanted to mention this table. This table is a uh, strong hands portable welding table. When strong hand, the welding table company came up with this portable welding table, I saw a review of it uh, by Jody of uh, Welding Tips, Tips and Tricks on YouTube. And I was really impressed with it and it actually was quite affordable. So I ended up uh, asking for this as my Christmas present one year. This is what I got. So it's a really great table. And now um, Harbor Freight and the other uh, cut rate companies have basically a cheap import version of this table. And uh, I can't speak to whether or not they're inferior quality because I've never, I've never had one of those. But I will say that I've used this on several occasions already for other things. And uh, it's, it is a handy table. What's nice is it folds up, it folds down, and folds up and can be basically placed up against the shop wall when not in use. It's light enough that I can pretty easily carry it around. So if I want to take it outside and use it outside on a nice day for stick welding. And uh, at the same time, it's heavy duty enough that it can take, you know, you can put some weight on it and it's perfectly fine. It's got these edge pieces that pop down too. and. You know, it's got, uh, this isn't a review of the table, so I'm going to try and stay on subject here. All right, so I'm going to draw on my safety equipment, fire up the welders, and we're going to see what we can do.
Well, so while Steve here uh, goes over and turns on the uh, argon shielding gas that he forgot to turn on, which is why that weld arc looked the way it did, uh, let me take a second to explain to you guys why you're not going to see any arc shots from that second camera. Unfortunately, uh, I had no idea what the video would look like until after I uh, finished everything and then I came upstairs and while I was editing it, I looked in the Pretty much the, all the video from that camera that was arc shots was useless. The camera was unable to focus with that lens in place. I'm going to have to try and get a camera that has a manual focus mode. So, sorry. Eh, arc's a little unstable at the start here, but it uh, smooths out. Oh, here's a mistake. I don't keep the cup near the cooling weld pool. Alright, so on this start, things look good right at the beginning. And uh, nice, smooth looking arc. Everything's uh, going fine. And then all of a sudden, this happens. So, of course, uh, I don't know what I'm doing, so I figure, hey, why don't I just ignore it and uh, try again and see what happens now. So things were going pretty good, and then all of a sudden that weird thing again. So I'm going to slow this down, uh, use the slow motion. This is going to be at 10% of normal speed, so we can maybe see what's going on.
the SD card on the uh, GoPro filled up while I was doing this, so not quite sure yet how much footage I ended up getting from that angle, but the, uh, and I have no idea until I go to edit whether or not any of these arc shots through this lens worked. So anyways, uh, <laughs> notes. Well, I actually don't think I did that bad in some spots. Um, this whole area in white right here, this weird discoloration, is all because I decided to try and use this rod that I have here as filler rod. And this is just a, I have a pile of these rods that I picked up at a estate sale. There was a whole bunch of um, stick rods there for arc welding. And uh, they were sitting on top of the boiler, and uh, they looked old as hell, so I didn't bother with those. But I did see this pile of this solid metal filler rod, so I thought, oh, well, I'll grab that. That might come, uh, dropped it. That might come in handy. So anyways, um, every time I tried to introduce that filler metal rod, whatever it is, it looks brass. Every time I tried to introduce that, things really got bad. The whole color of the plume changed, and there was a lot of uh, erratic sparking and horrible things going on. Now that it's starting to cool, I can see that it does have a very brass look. I'm wondering if that's brazing rod, if that's supposed to be for brazing. Um, I don't know exactly why you couldn't use brazing rod for TIG welding, as filler rod for TIG welding, but then again, I'm a noob, so. But anyways, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to buy some proper filler metal uh, for TIG welding and uh, use that. And then, you know, if I get good at doing that, um, then I can go back and experiment with those other rods, and if they act all kinds of crazy again, I know, well, obviously, this there's some sort of rod that I'm not supposed to be using. I do have some other ones that are more of a copper color. So, anyways, so I think the two really common types of filler rods for TIG are stainless steel and copper alloy, if I'm not mistaken. I may be mistaken again, I'm a noob. But anyways, I'll probably go see my counter guy at air gas and say, hey, what do you recommend for a noob starting out just practicing on mild steel and he'll set me up so anyways uh, other than that I'm pretty sure well I, I know I had the, I got in too close and had the uh, the tip of the tungsten stick a couple of times which if I understand correctly pretty much once that happens your tungsten's contaminated and you're supposed to stop and what I did was because I, this was really more about practicing, getting used to visualizing the puddle and the uh, keeping the distance correct. I just kept uh, you know, soldiering on, pushing through, which was probably a mistake. So I've been working at this for a little while and then uh, this thing actually started getting really hot. So this, this actually looks pretty decent right here, you know, oddly enough. focus so I'd say that those are the two uh, areas that I'm most proud of and that's no filler rod that's just uh, going along waiting for the puddle to form and then advancing a little bit and keeping the puddle just moving along now if I can do that and master adding the filler metal as I go along doing that that would be I, I would think a half decent weld